Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG. I want to welcome you to our monthly webinar series and give you a little bit of background on ESIG. For those of you not familiar with ESIG, we're a membership-based nonprofit organization providing our members with objective information, resources, and networking opportunities in support of renewable energy and energy systems integration decisions. ESIG does this through workshops, tutorials, webinars, blogs, working group and task force activities, and technical resource materials. Our most recent activity was our annual fall technical workshop, which was held online during the month of October and into early November. Our next major activity is our annual spring technical workshop, which will be held online during the month of March. Our workshops and monthly webinar series are open to everyone, so please feel free to register anytime on the eSIG website. Our workshops deal with a full range of issues associated with integrating wind, solar, and storage into electric, gas, and thermal systems. They also deal with the coupling to energy-consuming infrastructures, especially electric transportation, buildings, and industry. ESIG is a very unique organization, and I don't think you'll find anything quite like it anywhere else in the world. If you're new to ESIG, I strongly encourage you to follow up with us if you like what you hear, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. You can find us on the web at esig.energy, as well as on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. <clears throat> okay, just a few logistical matters before we get started. First of all, phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid unnecessary distractions. For the Q&A, we have moved to the Slido platform, and we're asking you to ask your questions through Slido at slido.com. You will not be able to ask your questions through WebEx. You need to go to slido.com on your device and enter eSIG17 as the event code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen. You will see a thumbs up button next to the questions to allow you to cast a vote. I'll prioritize the questions submitted. We plan to save 10 or 15 minutes for the Q&A at the end and then wrap it up at the top of the hour. An email with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. We also plan to provide short responses to unanswered questions after the webinar, so please don't be afraid to ask your question through Slido. Okay, so today our webinar consists of an update from NERC on inverter-based resource modeling guidelines and experience. Based on registrations, it looks like this is a very popular topic. The webinar will feature Ryan Quint, Senior Engineering Manager at NERC, who has been doing a lot of work in this area lately. Ryan, in his role at NERC, coordinates a number of NERC technical groups focused on emerging risks, grid stability, inverter-based resources, and modeling improvements. Ryan has recently become an active participant on Joint Working Group 5 of the IEC SC8A, a subcommittee of TC8 dealing with grid integration of renewable energy generation. I have to say that Ryan is not only a nationally recognized expert, but also an internationally recognized expert in this area. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback in the background. I'm not sure if somebody is uh, unmuted, but if you could mute until, until we get through this, that would be great. <clears throat> okay, just following up here, I feel very fortunate to have Ryan here with us today. And on a personal note, as I've gotten in the habit of doing, I took a look on LinkedIn last night and this is particularly interesting because I did the same thing a year ago when Ryan participated in a similar webinar on this topic. My shared connections with Ryan have continued to grow from 129 two years ago to 161 last year to 208 this year. Ryan, all I can say is you must be keeping some bad company. Anyway, <clears throat> I consider Ryan a good friend and a good friend of ESIG, and it's a pleasure working with him. The purpose of the webinar today is to familiarize key industry players with the latest efforts focused on modeling bulk power system connected inverter-based resources and the aggregate impact of distributed energy resources on the BPS. Just a short reminder once again to use Slido at slido.com with the event code of ESIG17 to ask your questions. Okay, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And Ryan, I'll now turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Charlie. It's uh, 
I always enjoy your your amazing introductions. I appreciate it, and uh, thanks thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm always very honored and humbled to be uh, hanging out with the ESA community and being able to present some of our work. So uh, I'm going to do my best to keep it brief and hit on some high points of things we've been doing uh, internally as well as externally. I'm going to focus predominantly on both power system connected uh, inverter based resources. Um, so without further ado, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, I always get a little scrambled when I've got to go pull up a new window in Slido and things like that. So I'll just reiterate, you can simply go to slido.com and, and put in that this event code e e617 and it's really easy to put your questions in there. Uh, and as Charlie mentioned, the, the recording will be, or the presentation is recorded and everything will be posted afterwards. So to give a uh, two disclaimers, I guess the first one is I'm, I'm battling a small tickle in my throat. So I've got uh, water, back of water, coffee, and something a little stronger under the table, depending on how bad it gets. So bear with me. <laughs> and uh, more importantly, the materials that I'm presenting here are, are not in any way, shape, or form related to compliance. I don't I don't work in compliance. So if you have compliance related questions, we can put you in touch with the appropriate regional entity or our NERC compliance assurance department. But uh, pretty much everything I'm talking about will be uh, is in some way, shape, or form a public thing uh, that has either been put out by uh, NERC in our regional staff or are, is part of our inverter-based resource performance working group. Um, so you'll hear me interchange uh, IRPTF and IRPWG a bit here. Uh, we IRPTF, which is a longstanding group that's been around for a handful of years now within the NERC realm, realm uh, was promoted to uh, a working group. <laughs> uh, not really promoted, but the I think the industry is realizing that these issues are no longer going away. I think we, we know that in the ESIC world. But uh, so rather than having it be a task force, we're now a working group, meaning uh, we will continue working and not necessarily have an end date in sight. So uh, that's good news, I guess, for some bad news for others. Uh, but it definitely keeps us busy, that's for sure. So uh, hopefully everyone is aware of, of the disturbance reports and the alerts and things we've put out. I always start with the slide now. We've had really four events, uh, and I'll talk about a fifth one here in a second, but uh, up till recently we had four events. The, the Blue Cut fire, that was the start of it all. We put out an alert after that. Then we had the Canyon 2 fire in October 2017. We put out another alert after that. That alert was fairly comprehensive. And then in April and May 2018, we had the Palmdale Roost Angeles Forest disturbances, uh, and those were very similar to the Blue Cut fire, but, but decently sized events. And then we went quiet for a bit, and we thought, wow, we, we've done a good job. We've mitigated a lot of these things. Maybe we got lucky. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but more recently, we had the San Fernando disturbance in July, July 7th, 2020. And we published a report uh, recently back in uh, November. And uh, again, this was uh, semi similar to the, the, the past events we've seen. But what I keep highlighting is that each event has its own unique characteristics. So while we see things like momentary cessation continuing to show up in a bunch of disturbances, each of the tripping mechanisms that are causing solar resources to, to you know, trip offline unexpectedly are different, right? So Blue Cup Fire was erroneous tripping on calculated frequency. Uh, Canyon 2 Fire was mainly transient AC over voltage. Palmdale Roos Angeles Forest were similar to that. And this one, uh, the San Fernando, we saw uh, AC overcurrent tripping. Uh, DC low voltage tripping, and in all of these, we've seen a bit of a uh, loss of synchronism, DC reverse current, that kind of stuff. So a uh, number of different tripping mechanisms, momentary cessation continues, and we and I'll talk about this in a second. We continue to see plant level controller interactions, which is sort of boiling up to be one of the biggest challenges I think we have. But this event, we had about a thousand megawatt reduction of bulk system connected inverters. We actually had two faults that were a couple minutes apart from each other. The second fault was a a uh, re-energization of a line that had a, a, a static wire that had fallen across all, all three phases. So a very rare situation, but we did get a, a bolted three-phase fault for all intents and purposes uh, in the Southern California area. Uh, so when I always joke now that, you know, as planners, we study both bolted three-phase faults and we don't see them that often in, in the real world. Now we can at least have an event we can point to with a disturbance report that says well, we do have bolted three-phase faults and they have a decent impact on the grid. <laughs> Uh, we did see in the Southern California Edison area a, a pretty prominent reduction of uh, in, increase, I guess, in net load, uh, which is likely attributed to DER tripping, and that was about 80 megawatts for that second fault event. So 
So the report's public. You can go look it up online or shoot me an email and I can get it to you. I'm not going to spend much time on it. But I did want to highlight some of the modeling things we've been looking at. So this is an example of a plant that went into momentary cessation in this event. The, the, they reported back to us saying, yes, we use momentary cessation. It occurs at 0.9 per unit. And again, for those that are new in this community, momentary cessation is where the resource uh, ceases current injection to the grid, both active and reactive current, and pauses, and then comes back over a period of time, uh, which is specified in the inverter controls. And so the, this facility is using 0.9 per unit as its threshold. And uh, when we look at the model, the model shows a VDIP of 0.85 per unit, a, a rate of active power recovery of one per unit per second. So it should take a second for the resource to come back after momentary cessation occurs. And there's about a 100 millisecond delay before the resource begins coming back uh, after the voltage has recovered to acceptable conditions. What we saw in this event was uh, you get this prominent drop in output from around 127 megawatts down to 80 megawatts and an initial spike back up, say, to 90 megawatts, which is typically, you know, sort of like one SCADA point resolution there. And then it takes about three minutes for that resource to come back to full power output. Some inverters tripped at this facility that I'm not going to get into that level of detail, but in essence, the model says the resource should come back in one second. And the resource is requiring three minutes to come back to reasturbance values. So, so that's obviously a, a concern, and it's attributed very likely to the plant level controller interacting with the inverters, uh, and that's not modeled in the positive sequence dynamic models that we use. Uh, here's another example. This facility is uh, explicitly told us they do not use momentary cessation. They've got newer inverters. Uh, they use K-factor dynamic voltage control for those inverters. A couple inverters tripped on AC overcurrent protection in this case, so we can ignore the reductions. You know, here, for example, in the top plot, you can see pre-disturbance at about 90 megawatts, post-disturbance at about 70 megawatts. That difference is the tripping of, of inverters on the AC overcurrent protection. It, but what happens is the plant reduces its active power output down to about 10 megawatts, takes 15, 10, 15 seconds, and it sits down at 10 megawatts and then slowly recovers back to some output level. But when we look at the model, and this one we actually did simulate, and we're working on a report actually comparing each of the models to the expected or the, to the performance we got to the real case, uh, you can see in that bottom plot there, the blue curve is the same as the blue curve up above in terms of it, the, the plant's actual active power response, and the orange curve is what the model says that the facility is doing. So the model says that it's a blip in time within, you know, less, you know, sub-second, the resource is back to full power output, and that's sort of what we would expect. But in reality, the resource is doing something very different. And again, it's likely attributed to some interaction of the inverter controls, plant level controls, et cetera. So uh, we did study this for a, a 0.3 per unit dip, a point. 7 per unit dip, a point 0.8 per unit dip. Uh, all of the simulation results looked identical to the orange, the orange one you can see there. So we sort of were able to say, we don't have the actual data of what the facility saw at the POI. We know it was a two and a half cycle, three phase, normally cleared fall. Uh, so voltages should recover back to, you know, acceptable voltages, you know, conditions at the POI, uh, at least around that time frame, if not a couple seconds, a couple cycles longer, but definitely not 10, 15 seconds. So, uh, there's obviously a clear difference here between the orange and the blue, and it's not a matter of do these squiggles look close enough, they don't even remotely match each other. So uh, it's sort of a, a grim tale, and, and quite frankly, we see this uh, on almost every facility we're looking at. Uh, so at the end, I'll hopefully get into some more positive stuff, but I'll keep on with the uh, what, what our leadership is saying, uh, uh, tear invoking. Uh, <laughs> they said some of these reports we put out are making them cry, but I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and, and I'll highlight some of that stuff at the end. So the modeling issues that I presented on in the past, the, particularly at last year's eSig webinar, uh, I had four pages, four slides worth of these modeling issues. I boiled it down to one slide, and I don't want to go through each one of these in significant detail, but I do want to touch on these issues because they're fundamental. And so we get buried and lost in some of the super technical fun discussions of do we need grid forming and all this stuff, but in reality, the vast majority of models that are out there are incorrect and unusable in some way, shape, or form, and that's concerning, to say the least. So the modeling issues that we see most predominantly are, are ones listed here. Most of the models don't pass basic model quality checks, at least at first. 
a lot of times they don't initialize. They're not in the right format. They're provided with the wrong software vendor as specified by the transition planner, uh, things like that. The biggest one is incorrect parameterization. The models do not match reality, reality being the actual installed equipment that's in, out there in the field. Uh, and we can compare that very easily with things like the NERC alert data where the facility tells us exactly what they do and you look at the model and it does something completely different. Uh, things like momentary cessation versus current injection or different set point, things like that. Uh, that is the that is, second bullet is probably the biggest challenge we have. Uh, the third bullet, particularly around solar PV, is, is a significant one as well. Most of the resources out there are using the REECB model, which is now considered obsolete rather than the REECA, and so we're having to sort of rework, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Lots of default parameter values. Not really going to touch on this, but a lot of facilities out there have the default PSLF, PSSE manual values, so some consultant is probably hired and they plug in generic values, and that model somehow gets submitted to the TPPC, and that ends up in a base case, and that becomes the model, you know, for forever <laughs> until somebody highlights that that model is very likely a default value. The other thing we see is that the model of one facility, a solar plant or a wind plant, matches hundreds of other facilities out there in the field, which is also, we've heard from the OEMs, highly unlikely that uh, the model used for one facility is going to have identical parameter values to hundreds of other plants out there. Uh, even if they are the same manufacturer, they're likely a different make model, uh, type of control settings, different plant level controller settings, things like that. Uh, and then we've heard from the wind manufacturers that no two wind farms are going to have the same model because of turbine heights and wind speed and all these kinds of things. Uh, so that, that was very eye-opening for us. Uh, uncoordinated parameters, the parameters as we've highlighted in the past are setting these models up is extremely complicated and we see a lot of parameter values that don't line up, don't match. Um, changes being made in the in the field and then the models are not being updated. We've heard ad hoc from multiple GOGOPs that they'll go make a change and they sort of ignore the fact that the model needs to go with it uh, and there's not a lot of really clear requirements exactly on how do we handle that. I'm going to talk more about that here in a bit. Um, PPs and P PCs often lack information or data to be able to perform validity checks or verification checks, however you want to call it. So uh, do I have a screenshot of a plant controller set setting sheet or a spec sheet or an inverter spec sheet or one line diagram? Do I have all that stuff as a planner to be able to say, yes, the model I received matches a reasonable assumption of what I think this facility is doing? We hear time and time again that the transmission planners say, I get a model, I have to trust it because I don't get anything else. And, and I think we've all come to realize that that's just a failure of the interconnection requirements because you should be requiring that uh, a suitable amount of documentation comes along with that model to be able to verify that the, the software version and the settings and the controls and all that stuff match the field settings and the model match reasonably. And we need to be able to perform those validity checks on all sides to make sure that model is reasonable. One thing, the IRPTF, before it was converted to WG, Highlighted, they put a white paper out and there's stars out currently, um, is uh, the some of the gaps in mod 26 and 27. They, they give a false impression that the act model is entirely accurate, particularly for large disturbances. Uh, and I continue to highlight that mod 26 and 27 verify uh, a number of parameter values that you can count on pretty much less than one hand, uh, but these models have well over 120 parameters associated with them. So we can't, you know, make that false assumption that verifying four or five parameter values means I have a verified model. It means I have verified four or five parameter values. The other 125 parameter values have not been verified. And uh, I think we've given this false impression that if I receive a Mod 26 test report, that model's good. Uh, that's not true. It, and in many cases, we've had to fight that battle to say, well, that model is actually bad. Uh, the tests that were performed don't capture things like momentary cessation or any of the large disturbance behavior. So to me these days, uh, having the things like spec sheets, screenshots, pictures is, is 10 times more valuable than a Mod 2627 verification report. And uh, IRPWG has published documentation and SARS are underway to get these things updated. Um, we've heard time and time again that the interconnection timeline process, there's a crunch in there around performing adequate amounts of studies, doing enough quality checks, and that continues to be a challenge. And then we throw in batteries and hybrid plants. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That adds complexity here. 
Uh, and all of this to say we've only touched on the fundamental frequency positive sequence dynamic models, and we haven't even got into the EMP models. So we're in, uh, we've got a lot of work to do to try to address these problems and fix these things, uh, and it's definitely going to keep us busy. So NERC and WEC uh, decided to do sort of an objective analysis. We, we got together with WEC staff and said, let's take a look at the latest and greatest WEC base case. So we pulled the latest steady state base case, we linked up the very latest, as of essentially the day we ran the analysis, we grabbed the, their master dynamics file, which is all of the models that had been submitted to WEC at that time uh, through the revision process, et cetera. And we did a very high level objective analysis of what's in that base case. How reasonable is it? So that report's 30 pages or so. Uh, highly recommend taking a look. It's very humbling uh, and it definitely highlights some, some issues needing attention and it provides recommendations to industry around things that need to be addressed. Let me, I'll touch on one or two points from, from the document. Uh, the first thing, let's start with the wind. So let's take that plot on the left. We looked at, you know, what are the, the, the wind plant generator converter models that are used in the facilities out there today, in the base case. Uh, blur your eyes a bit and, and look at that big red line. Everything above that line is using a model that is incorrect, obsolete, or no models provided at all. And so if you zoom in, the figure's a little blurry, but uh, about a quarter of those units are using obsolete first generation models for type three and type four turbines. About 10% of the fleet is modeled with a Gen Rao. 10% uh, of the fleet is modeled with no dynamic model. And the rest are miscellaneous types of models that are used. Now, because that sort of glass half full, glass half empty type thing, the 50% the of the fleet is modeled with models that we would say are reasonable. Now, we haven't even started looking at the parameter values in those models. And what we did notice uh, on the bottom part of that red curve where they are using appropriate models is that the vast majority of those models are using default values. So those are also considered incorrect in some way, shape, or form. Now, we haven't gone in and done much analysis there. We really kept it at a high level. And high level, you can see 50% of the models are uh, mostly obsolete or incorrect. Now, we've looked at, let's take a little, let's go a little deeper. About 3,100 megawatts out there use, are representing wind turbines with Gen Rao. And so we thought, well, maybe those are legacy. Maybe those are old, old, old type ones and twos. Uh, and, and maybe we can give them an out to say, well, they're super legacy models and they did the best they can given the technology that they had available to them a long time ago, right? Uh, what we found was that half of the fleet is ty are type three wind turbines, fairly new ones. Uh, and they were modeled with Gen Rao models. About 20% are type four and the remaining 30% are type ones and twos and you know, actually 10% of that. Uh, the transmission planner said, I don't have a clue what type of turbines are out there, and I couldn't get that information from the generator owner. So that's concerning in and of itself. On the solar side, uh, again, I said earlier, most of the models are using REECB. That's the electrical control model for the, for the solar PV facility. The original guidance, the legacy guidance that came out from WEC was to use REECB. It was a simplified dynamic model. Uh, and, and all the OEMs latched onto that and said, okay, we'll give you a model with REECB, uh, and here it is. And so 93% of the capacity, install capacity out there is using an REECB model. Every single inverter manufacturer has come out to us and said, we do not recommend the use of REECB. It's simplified. It doesn't capture major performance characteristics. One, it doesn't match, your mom match momentary cessation. It doesn't capture momentary cessation. Uh, for legacy equipment and two, for resources that are using uh, uh, dynamic current injection, it, it, it's such a simplified model that it doesn't reasonably represent what we do. And so every OEM has come out and said, we really don't recommend that model. So we have a lot of uphill, you know, rework to do to fix this problem because it's not 20%, it's not 50%, it's 93% of the full capacity out there is represented using a model that uh, every OEM says, I don't recommend using that model. So that, that's another concerning thing that's, that's getting addressed right now. So I wanted to move into the, the timeline process, and there's a lot of work going into, well, what's the root cause of all these modeling challenges that we face? And so I, I showed this slide last year, and I, I haven't really updated it, but there's this timeline that we have to consider around feasibility study all the way down to the plant's operation. And I'm doing system-wide model verification, same with Mod 33. And there's 
tons of steps along the way around the level of detail of the model, the, the certainty of that model that's being provided, et cetera, et cetera. So we can get lost in conversations around, okay, well, when I submit my interconnection request, I don't know the make and model of the facility that's being submitted. Uh, I don't know what type of inverter, uh, you know, make and model is being used. So I don't have a model for that and I can't submit it in the feasibility study. And then I get to the system impact study and I'm a little more certain on the type of model that's being provided. I have a little bit more certainty around the configuration of the plant design, things like that. Uh, and then when I get to commissioning, that's when I have everything kind of solidified. Uh, and when you work your way through the process, everything's actually fairly clear in the, say, LGIA, LGIP, but it, it definitely needs more attention here that everything goes back to that very initial interconnection request. Any change that is made to that interconnection request, make, model of, of, of uh, inverter, change in plant configuration, plant capacity, all those kinds of things, requires a restudy. And it sort of says that point blank in the requirements. And that's just not happening in the actual interconnection process. So if I submit something in the feasibility study and I change it when I get to the system impact study, the planner should be doing a full new set of studies because that, that can change the electrical performance of that facility. That can change reliable operation of the bulk power system. And then you get into commercial operation, uh, commissioning, all that kind of stuff, and then ultimately what lands in that interconnection-wide base case. And as we just showed, the vast majority of models in those interconnection-wide base cases have some type of problem associated with it. So everything above that Mod 32 case creation box, there's a there's a a link here that's broken and we need to try to fix that. So this is actually something IRPWG is, is going to be working on in the upcoming year. Uh, Vestas gave a really good presentation at our last meeting talking about, uh, you know, their recommendations. It's a proposal and we're going to adapt it and use it as a starting point. But starting at the, you know, the grid interconnection requirements are fundamental and I'll touch on that here in a bit. And then you go through the study process, the system impact study, additional studies, you got compliance obligations that they mentioned there. And then you go through the validation process, and then then you're running long-term planning studies, et cetera. Uh, really, what they recommended is is I need a user-defined model, a really accurate model to do my system impact studies, my local reliability assessments, uh, any type of detailed modeling that may be needed, things like EMT, weak grid analysis, that kind of stuff. And then maybe when I get to the interconnection-wide case, maybe I can use a standard library model or something like that. And so I know that's a challenge that. Entities will come back and say, well, well, this transmission planner will only allow WEC models or, or uh, standardized library models. And this entity, but this entity requires user-defined models. And I think we're at the point now where our recommendations, at least in terms of the IRPWG guidelines, say you should be requiring both. You should have a, a user-defined model. You should have a benchmarked standardized library model, and those models should reasonably match each other to some extent. And then the transition planner should be responsible for using those models accordingly. Now, most requirement documentation don't cover it in that level of detail, and I think we're starting to get there. Entities are making changes to their requirements, uh, and so we're seeing progress in this area, but there's a lot of catch-up that's needed. And again, we haven't really even got into the EMT type analysis. I've got a couple slides on that, but all of this applies to EMT as well. Uh, getting an EMT model up front is, is becoming sort of a paramount. Uh, the IRPWG submitted, actually submitted as part of that white paper, an SAR and a drafting team is now being stood up to update the FAC1 and FAC2 standards. Uh, and what IRPWG realized with their, is that there was a very clear confusion around the term material modification. Uh, Material modification links back to the FERC, LGIP, SGIP process, and it really talks about uh, your, your place in the queue. And do I have an, am I making a material modification that there's a cost implication of my queue location relative to all the other projects? Uh, the FAC2 standard uses the same terminology and says, uh, if a change is made to the facility that the transmission planner deems material, material modification, that's going to re re require a rework, a restudy, and there was uh, sort of no intention that, that those be linked together. I think it was an unfortunate use of similar terminology, but one is, one is economic market-driven, one is reliability-driven, and so we're, I'm going to focus in on the fact-type stuff, 
And really what we said is that any change to the electrical behavior of the facility needs to be restudied because that's going to affect reliable operation of the bulk power system. So inverter, make, model, software version, controller settings, plant level control modes, model, make, software version, control settings, any changes to the steady state or dynamic controls, changes in plant configuration, plant topology, plant capacity, all these things should be considered a material modification from the study standpoint, not necessarily the Q position standpoint. So uh, that sort of just goes back to the previous slide where we showed the different studies and the need to be running uh, adequate amounts of studies and restudying if changes are made. It sort of aligns with that mentality from the study perspective. So again, just to highlight, fact two is where in the guidelines and technical basis section, we, we highlight uh, entities should have documentation, the, the TPs and PCs should have documentation around their, their rationale for determining what is a material modification, and then to apply that in the study process, and, and, and there's a recognition here that material modification will vary from entity to entity. We did a brief analysis, uh, Rich and I did, and, and we found that most entities, not all, but a lot of them, simply say material modification equals go see FERC definition. So inherently there's confusion here on, on how this thing gets applied. And when you go look at the FERC definition, it's a uh, modification that has a material impact on the cost or timing of the interconnection request. So am I going to change when this thing goes in service, which would then change my queue position, or is it change the cost substantially? And so there's a, there's a very different mentality or purpose behind these two uses of the term. I mentioned Mod 26 and 7 and the challenges there. Uh, I won't spend much more time on this, um, but there will be a drafting team likely in 2021, I believe, uh, that will be starting down the, the process of how do we rethink Mod 26 and 7. The small disturbance verification tests are not getting us useful data. Uh, we need to do something different. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a super technical thing. The way I sort of described it is uh, I, I take a model and I take a, a, an actual event and I see squiggles that lay on top of each other. That doesn't mean that my model is useful. It doesn't mean that that model is accurate or, 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 or validated or verified really in any way, particularly for inverter-based resources. Uh, like I said earlier, the having some screenshots and actual plant settings and plant configuration sheets and things like that, to me, is much more valuable to be able to compare that to a model and say, do these things even remotely match? Because on those prior slides where I showed the blue plot versus the orange plot, and they're drastically different, we're not to the point in today's technolo technology and, and practices where we see squiggles that lay on top of each other, we're seeing things that are tr drastically different from one another, and we need to fix those things first before we start worrying about our squiggles matching. Uh, and, and all of this it goes into a base case, which then goes into studies and is leading us to studies that I think we can say are not as accurate as we hoped they, sh they would be, which is, which is a concern. So that's sort of the driver why this the, the, this, this topic is, is quite important. So like I mentioned, the small disturbances, you get these great simulations that lay on top of each other. You know, that these have been published, uh, you know, First Solar has done a lot of work in this area and that it, you know, give the credit is due that we're seeing good matches in the small disturbance realm. And so I get a response and they lay right on top of each other in terms of actual or simulation. But again, that doesn't verify the large disturbance parameter set, which is the vast majority of parameters that are out there. So uh, like I mentioned, when I go through the verification process at a high level, really what we need is assurance that every parameter is a reasonable assumption, a reasonable representation of the facility. Now, people throw their arms in the air and say, well, you can't expect verification of every parameter. And I, I sort of ask, well, why not? Because verification can be comparison with a spec sheet or maybe this is a, a, a measurement time constant. And so there's an expectation that that's going to be 0.02 because it is in every other single, every other model out there in the, in the world, right? So, uh, you know, we can check off a lot of these to say, well, it's a default value. This is in there to make the model work. It's not related to a controller setting. And so there goes about 15, 20% of the parameter values. Uh, we can then look at the plant level controller model and there goes, you know, 15% of the other models. Then we can look at, is the plant using reactive you know, current injection or momentary cessation and what's their K factor and how fast does their active power recover after the fault. And there goes another 30% of the parameters. I've only got a handful left that I could verify. And I haven't compared squiggle against squiggle yet. I've, I've, I've done something, in my opinion, that's much more valuable 
in terms of comparing what's out there in the field versus what my model thinks it should be. Um, and we can maybe mirror that or, or complement that with some form of validation, uh, and I'll talk more about that here in a bit. So again, the models that we use to represent, particularly inverter-based resources, are a representation of the plant as a whole, and we always have to keep that in mind. And sometimes we lose that when we get into the really technical stuff, uh, and I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. But this is a very simplistic plot. I, I pulled a beautiful, you know, picture from uh, SMA's website around, you know, we have to remember that there's there's acres and acres of solar panels out there, hundreds or thousands of inverters that then have a long collector line that brings them to a substation. In that substation, I have, you know, reactive devices and other things, and then I maybe have a gen tie line that goes out to my point of interconnection down the road. And all of that needs to be modeled in that model that goes into a base case and then we use to run planning studies, right? So the OEMs are providing components to the overall model. They're not generally providing the whole model. Now, in some cases, the OEM does provide the plant level model and helps make sure it's all accurate. Uh, I've seen both. But we have to remember that, that you know, if you've got, you know, I'm using SMA here as an example, but the SMA or, or, or you know, Siemens Gamesa or Vestas, whoever it is, they're providing an inverter model or a wind turbine model, et cetera. And then they, maybe they supply the plant level controller, or maybe it's a third party that's supplying the plant level controller. And so those two components are coming from an OEM. And now someone's got to compile that all into an aggregate model where I've got an inverter that maybe now needs to represent a thousand inverters or a hundred inverters. And I've got a plant level controller that needs to be representative of how does this all work together. And then I have to add in all those other components like the collector aggregate and the, the main power transformer and all that stuff. And typically that's a consultant or somebody that's going to be executing that for the developer or the, uh, the generator owner. So then the question terms, this is messy and this is a proposal and we've just started down this in one of our guideline documents in the IRPWG, but we need to more explicitly get into what does this validation process look like? So the, the OEMs of the equipment, whether it's an inverter OEM or a plant level controller OEM, uh, can be doing things like factory test reports, hardware in the loop testing, field testing, disturbance-based validation, all these types of things, benchmarking really detailed EMT models with positive sequence models. All of those things are things the OEM has the tools and capabilities to perform. So when they provide a model, they should have some documentation that that model is valid in some way. Now, some OEMs may not do factory testing, some may not do disturbance-based validation, some may not do hardware in the loop testing, but they should have some form of validation to say, the way I came up with this model, I believe is, I certify is valid, that it matches in a specific make model software version of an equipment that's installed in the field and the settings match what my expectation is what's out there in the field, right? So it's not just a model, it's model plus documentation. All of that gets goes to the generator owner or the developer who does some form of model validation verification. And that's looking at plant design, aggregation techniques, equipment spec sheets, one line diagrams, plant level controller configuration sheets, nameplate photos, all those kind of things. And, and that's really the accompanying documentation to say, here's how I came up with a plant level model that I feel is a reasonable check. Now, ideally, the GEO would also be performing some model quality tests or the consultant that the GEO has hired is, is executing some high-level model quality checks. And we really rely on, down in the bottom left there, the transition planner modeling requirements to specify or require what those checks are. So if the TPPC doesn't say, hey, I need you to check the model to make sure it passes basic ride-through tests and can handle phase jumps and can handle, uh, you know, provide the right amount of frequency response and dynamic voltage control and all these kind of things, uh, then the GEO is not going to test it because it hasn't been required. And so they don't know otherwise to say, well, why would I go do extra credit when I can just provide you the model if you'll accept it, right? So there should be requirements in place to say you got to do some basic checks so that you have some verification that the model is a reasonable representation of what's out there and is basic, you know, passes basic quality checks. But when the model is received by the transmission planner, they may do some additional rigor testing to make sure when I put it in a base case, it matches, you know, it works well with other models, it's usable, it's appropriate, uh, I have suitable documentation, I know who to contact, who to call if the thing breaks, 
and then I can go use it in studies. And so we're working on trying to explain this process more, or, you know, articulate it better, because I don't think up till today we really had a clear process. Now, each entity does it a little different, and we're hoping to bring some consistency here across the industry uh, by, by putting out something in this area, hopefully in the early part of next year. Uh, I've harped on these guidelines in the past for over a year now since this one's the September 2019 there on the right. Uh, but the first guideline there that we first put out in September 2018, that was the, the guideline that was sort of the cornerstone document for North America around how do we want bulk power system connected inverter-based resources to behave when they're on the bulk power system, right? When they're connected to the grid on the bulk system, how do we want them to behave? This is not distribution level, it's just bulk system level. We followed that up with the guideline there on the right in September 2019 around what improvements should every transmission owner, planner, planning coordinator be making to their interconnection requirements to ensure that we're getting that performance, getting the modeling information we need, and, and having the verification of those models. And so uh, I'll just highlight again on this slide, because everything, all the discussions that we have with industry uh, between Rich and myself essentially come back to this guideline. Everything that we continue to harp on is in this guideline. That, that there are actionable recommendations in this guideline, and there's been some big success stories. Uh, certain entities have gone and copy-pasted this guideline into their modeling requirements or their uh, performance requirements, and we're starting to see either bits and pieces or entire sections of the document being covered in industry's interconnection requirements, and I think that's helping in a lot of ways because the guideline is not pushing for additional performance, more rigorous performance, uh, it's simply saying you need to clarify and, and specify a lot of these things because the physical traits we get from a synchronous generator, we don't get that from an inverter-based resource. So if you don't specify it, you're going to get whatever the OEM or the developer thinks you want, which likely isn't what you want. So spell it out. It doesn't have to be a rigorous, uh, you know, rigorous requirement. Just make it clear and consistent, and that will help everybody. And so I think we've seen tremendous progress in this area. And so, again, the recommendation is that, all POs, TPs, PCs, per the FAC1 NERC standard, uh, should consider the guideline, adopt its requirements into their own interconnection requirements as applicable, uh, and use the guideline to the extent that they can. So just a couple of final slides as I wrap up. We're in the new world of realizing that EMT studies are becoming extremely valuable. And now uh, IRPWG is in the process of working on uh, a fairly lengthy guideline, reliability guideline on EMT modeling. Now there's a lot of work in this area, a lot of great materials been put out by IEEE, Seagray, et cetera. And, and our, our goal is that the NERC guideline will just continue to help support industry's efforts in this area. Now EMT studies have been used for a long time and the guy, our guideline covers that, that there are things that are not IBR related where EMT studies have been used. The things that I'm showing here are the use cases for using EMT models uh, for specifically for inverter-based resource studies. Now there are other tools in some cases that can be used to study some of these things. We're not saying EMT is the only type of modeling approach or study approach, but there's there, there are use cases and real-world examples out there of EMT models being used for these purposes. So I'm not going to go into each one of these, but uh, ride-through capability and performance is a big one, particularly for unbalanced grid conditions, uh, testing low short circuit strength conditions, controls instability type conditions, um, verifying or developing a short circuit model even in some cases, doing unbalanced power flow, uh, subsynchronous control interaction type studies, uh, things like this, EMT models can and are being used for uh, used today uh, to study. Now, I think we're facing this challenge. Or we're coming to this realization, and it's actually in our NERC guideline, uh, that one I just mentioned on the interconnection requirements, that if you don't get a model early in the interconnection process, you're not going to get a model for an EMT study, and you're going to have to essentially come up with a, a generic one or something like that, because after that facility is commercial in commercial operation, unless it's spelled out in your requirements to say, uh, you know, you have to provide a model, and then if we ask you down the road to provide a new model or an updated model, you have to, you know, do that as well. That's not spelled out. You're not going to get a model. And we've heard, you know, kind of horror stories around trying to get a model and not being able to do that. I think we're doing better now, but it's still a challenge. So the best thing I think we've all realized is to spell those requirements out, make it really clear for the developers, 
for the generator owners exactly what you want, and the developers will then go work with the OEMs and the, the, the consultants and stuff to provide you exactly what you need. Uh, but get that early, even if you aren't planning to run an EMP study, get the model because 10, 15 years from now when your super strong grid becomes a weak grid because you had a bunch of synchronous machines uh, retire for various reasons, you may have a large pocket that all of a sudden went from a strong grid to a low short circuit grid and you've got to run you know, low short circuit type studies unexpectedly, unexpectedly being maybe we didn't plan for that 10 years ago, but it's now on our doorstep and I need real accurate models. Or maybe I need to, you know, I've got a, a pocket of resources. I have one facility and it's a fairly strong grid, but now I add five, six, seven, ten other inverter-based resources at the same interconnecting substation, and now all of a sudden I've got a fairly low short circuit strength grid condition. These are not unheard of or uncommon types of conditions. We see these pretty regularly, and a lot of the a lot of the uh, resources that are are involved in the events like say the San Fernando event come from pockets of generation just like this where you've got a whole lot of inverter-based resources in one location doing strange anomalous things and without an EMT model we really won't be able to study it uh, with sufficient level of detail. One of the last things I'll mention here is uh, we are working on a, a guideline on uh, performance modeling and studies for battery energy storage and hybrid power plants connected at the bulk power system. Uh, so again all the prior guidance we put out uh, is applicable to uh, battery energy storage and hybrid plants, but there are special characteristics, traits about batteries and hybrids that deserve additional attention. It's, 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 it's complicated, I guess, to say the least. Now, there's a lot of value uh, and a lot of flexibility that these resources can provide to the grid, and it's just a matter of we need to spell that out and we need to talk about how do we want these things to behave? How do we want them set uh, when they're connected to the bulk power system? And then when we get into the modeling, we got to think about, we got to have specific modeling requirements for hybrid plants, co-located plants, et cetera. And how do we want these things modeled for our studies? And then when we get into the study realm, everything gets, frankly, really complicated, right? Because rather than having solar come on in the morning and off in the afternoon, uh, as an example, now we've got a solar facility that is now uh, playing into the market because it's got a battery and can provide a bunch of great ancillary services. So again, there's a lot of value there, but it makes the studies quite complicated. And so we have to think through as an industry, a planning industry around how are we going to run studies when we've got 10,000 batteries in our base case and every wind and solar plant uh, maybe newly interconnecting has a battery attached to it too. I don't think the, the simulation platforms are really ready for this uh, level of variability and there's gotta be ways we can maybe do this better. So it's things we can think through, right? I mean, this is this is hopefully intended to uh, inspire the really smart people that are on the call here to, to tackle these problems. So the last thing I'll leave us with is, is sort of the driver again for all of this, that the models are used to execute studies. We all understand that. The studies that we use are to identify reliability issues or potential reliability issues, develop correct, corrective action plans, and make reliability decisions, right? And this goes both ways. But in this direction, the decisions we're making are in, reliant on the studies that are performed, adequate studies, suitable studies, and the studies that we're performing are reliant on accurate models. So if you up, upstream, if you've got bad models, all the things I talked about uh, that are entering base cases and assumptions are being made about how things are behaving, that trickles into the studies. And then we've got studies that maybe aren't as accurate as we hope. And so our, our, our reliability decisions as accurate as we want them to be. I think we have to think through that as an industry. And, and again, the, the goal of, of this point is really to highlight that the modeling is, is very important. Uh, and I think we're realizing that now at, at various levels on our side and around the industry, uh, I think modeling kind of went to the wayside, you know, three, four, five years ago, and now it's coming right back to the forefront. Um, as, as we're realizing we've done, going all the way back to the Blue Cup fire, the focus was on how the performance is off. We need to fix these solar plants that are misbehaving. And now it's really more focused on, okay, yeah, some, re some legacy resources are using momentary cessation 
We've eliminated that. We're in good shape. We've got a small amount doing, you know, strange tripping behaviors. We can work with them to fix that. Oh, but all the models seem to be problematic. And, and I think that's boiling up as uh, something that is the most systemic challenge we have with these events that we need to overcome. So uh, I'll leave it at that. I think, again, hopefully this wasn't too bleak. Uh, hopefully a little humbling, but hopefully it sparks some some industry action to improve things in this area. So a whole lot of uh, 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 hyperlinks here for you all to get involved and digest. And again, feel free to reach out to me with, with any questions. Uh, my contact information is, is there at the bottom. Thanks, Ryan, for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation. So let's move to the Q&A. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. And I have to say, Ryan, the most popular question is the one you asked in the beginning, whether or not you should keep your beard. And if you look through the responses, you'll see that there's uh, some on each side of that question. So I think no definitive response. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, moving on to uh, Mahesh. Uh, use of UDM, user-defined model. Does it not make it more difficult to ensure that all the suppliers use the same approach and not have differences between their modeling approach? Yeah, it's a, it's a good it's a good question and a good comment made by Mahesh. Um, when I when I relate it back to uh, this is sort of unrelated, but when I relate it back to the the NERC performance standards, we're really focused on the performance and not how it's done, right? So when you look at NERC standards, we, we need an expected level of performance, and we don't dictate how it's done. We leave that flexibility up to innovation by the industry. And I think that's what the, the goal of standards is to set a bar of a expected level of performance or, or a need or something like that and to leave some flexibility to innovation to allow the really smart people in lab coats to do the right thing as long as it's understood in a sufficient enough way uh, that the, the end user of that product can understand it suitably, right? So that being the transmission planner, planning coordinator, right? So uh, in my opinion, you know, the real code models, things like that. There's a lot of great work that can go into that to come up with great user-defined models that are robust and functionally they don't break when I put them into studies and we can make better uh, advancements in that area. But we need to allow the OEMs to, you know, maybe do things differently as long as it's transparent, I think. Uh, making every solar plant behave exactly the same way, I don't know how realistic that is. So, I guess I'll just I'll leave it at that, um, that we need some level of standardization. Uh, I think we're headed in the right direction there, but we got to have flexibility to allow some differences. Okay, I think we'll just uh, go ahead with the next question from Marcelo Elizondo from PNL with respect to the UD EMT models. Is there still a barrier with uh, regards to manufacturers and willingness to share detailed models? And has the NERC working group identified a path forward to overcome the barriers? Yeah, so that's a good question, Marcelo. We're, we're really trying to document that in our EMT guideline that's coming out. So the, the first thing I'll mention is when we get into the world of EMT, uh, again, within the scope of the stuff that, that at the NERC level we're concerned about, we're not looking at research-type activities. We're not looking at academic studies. We're looking at studies of real facilities that are to be built or are already built uh, real type of equipment. So in that case, there's no such thing as a non-UDM model, right? The, the, the concept of a generic model or a standardized EMT model is uh, we sort of throw that out the window, right? Because they're good, maybe good for academic studies, far-reaching planning type stuff way in the long term. But when we're talking about real equipment, we want an EMT model that is as representative of the real equipment as possible. So things like real code models. And again, you need validation that the real code model is still correct, uh, you know, matching up to the software version, all those kind of things, and we can do that. Um, but but again, the, the the UDM on EMT model is really critical. Now the question there, are there barriers by manufacturers on willingness? From what I've seen, I, I think the answer is no. I think the the, the OEMs that I've talked to they want a little more flexibility, like, a, like I just mentioned. They all do things a little bit differently. Some push for real code. Some push for, you know, verified use of block diagrams that they think are a reasonable representation. And they generally black box the whole thing anyways, at least in terms of the inverter controls. And so we, we probably shouldn't expect as a planner to be able to see those inside of those models. 
But again, it comes back to the planner should be uh, dictating that they get enough data to be able to perform validation. So uh, I don't think there's an unwillingness to, to get to the UDM, you know, detailed EMT models. Uh, but again, we got to specify and spell out exactly what we need on the transmission side. Okay. Well, I'm going to take a couple of questions from Mike George of PGE, Ryan. There's one up here uh, that you'll see underneath Marcello's. Is there some standard form available between DER owners and grid owners in order to standardize and specify the parameters needed in these shared models? And then a related uh, to that, further down, a couple more questions from from the mic. This standard modeling form ought to be open slash editable by all concerned parties so that real-time refinements and updates can be made to these models. The form could feed an algorithm to perform automatic studies, which would integrate manufacturer's specs and ease the work associated with these studies. And then the standard form could also link to the correct and present-day standard as applicable to each parameter. So a lot of thoughts there rolled into one. Yeah, so I got to scope, scope myself a bit. So nothing I talked about today was DER related. So I, I got to clarify that. So we're talking about bulk system connected inverter-based resources. Now, uh, maybe I can twist Charlie's arm to come back and talk about our work on the DER front uh, maybe next year. But the... I'll stick to the bulk power system stuff, and, and that may help with some of the complexity. Now, the first point, I think, is is something that the industry has struggled with for a very long time, and, and ultimately the standards have fallen out to say having every single planning entity use the, a standardized form, at least with today's capabilities, is, is not feasible. And so that's why we don't have something like a standard form that every transition planner would use uh, some have really cool online portals where you put in the data and it flags bad data and stuff like that, and that helps lead them to good models. Uh, others allow spreadsheets or Word documents or what have you. Some require an actual model. Some require, uh, like I mentioned, tabular form or something like that. So everyone does it kind of differently. Uh, now, getting to the more kind of exciting stuff about, well, the, the form should be editable by all parties and there should be an algorithm that automatically executes studies. Uh, I, I, I hope one day we can get there. I think right now, uh, having been planner and working closely with planners, it, it's sort of a data management nightmare uh, for a planner because the tools really aren't all that great to be able to handle this, this level of uh, information and data that comes in. So I think it's something we can strive for. Uh, I don't know how realistic it is in the, in the near term, but it is definitely kind of a exciting, innovative area to have some type of automated form that would then convert into a model that we could already deem as appropriate uh, and would sort of pass a set of, of validation checks and things like that. Hopefully we can get there at some point. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not talking about DERs here, uh, talking about bulk system connected stuff. And, you know, maybe Mike, you and I can connect offline to talk about DERs. Okay. DERs next year, Ryan. <laughs> okay. Let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more in the, the two minutes remaining. From Rishi, to what extent is it possible to improve standards like Mod 26 to capture more of the model parameters that are relevant to large disturbance behavior? That will be the question for the drafting team in 2021. <laughs> so, uh, Rishi, I recommend you uh, throw your name in the hat to nominate yourself for the standard drafting team. But the question is really the crux of what that SAR is, is was submitted for to say, we need to do something to that standard to, to have verification that the parameters that are in a model are reasonable. And so, again, the Mod 26, 27 standards look at matching squiggles. Uh, one is a modeled response and one is an actual response to a small grid disturbance, uh, which is like a cap switching event or a play-in function or something like that. But it doesn't capture the large disturbance stuff. Now, we're not going to go down the realm of, of – you know, rolling out trailers and doing bolted faults on the grid at every every plant. Uh, we don't do that here in North America, nor do I think anyone wants to be doing that. And so we have to find a balance. So to me, maybe it's a set of small disturbance tests with uh, appropriate level of documentation provided to 
have 100% assurance that the large disturbance stuff is a reasonable representation. And maybe there's some standards language that we can keep pretty benign that says you've got to be checking for the large disturbance stuff and you got to put a check mark next to that some, some way, shape, or form. I think to me that would be a big step in the right direction in and of itself. So I think it is possible. It'll be a bit more outside the box and not necessarily squiggle matching. Okay. I think it's top of the hour. There's a lot of good questions left, but I want to tell everybody that we'll do our best to get some answers out as soon as Ryan can get to there for the next couple of days. And um, appreciate your your uh, queuing up all those good questions. But we're going to need to wrap it up. So as I mentioned earlier, the email will go out with the video file. Uh, I want to encourage you to send any follow-up questions that you have to info at energy, and we'll get them included and answered as well. We appreciate your engagement. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar, which will be held on January 20th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Deepak Ramasubhavanan of EPRI will be speaking on his work regarding frequency control aspects of an increasingly inverter-based grid, and we hope you'll be able to join us once again. Further information on all webinars and meetings can be found on our website at ESIG.energy under events, and there are newsletters and informational emails, and you're all invited to attend. Ryan, I want to thank you again for this very timely, informative, thought-provoking webinar, and thank all of you for your interest. We look forward to seeing you again in January. And in the meantime, everyone, take care, stay safe, happy holidays, and thanks again for your